All right. We are going to be taking a break from our First Corinthians series. And over the next few weeks, tonight, and then the following two Wednesday nights, uh, we've got a short series, Christmas series, called Wonder. Um, we're going to see three things over the next few weeks. Tonight, we'll see anticipation, the anticipation of hope. And then next week, we'll see arrival, the arrival of hope. And then the week after that, the third week, will be the adoration of hope, adoration and uh, that third week, we will climax with uh, communion that night, on that third night. The, that'll be just a couple of nights, few nights before Christmas. And so hopefully you'll uh, be able to join us. And hopefully some of our, um, uh, the rest of our group will be able to pack the place out because I think you guys will be out of school that week, right? The week of Christmas? Yeah. You guys out? Okay, good. So hopefully everybody will be able to make it that night and celebrate with us and remember what this is all about. But tonight we'll be in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll look at, uh, we'll start at verse 26. So you can open up there. And again tonight we are seeing the anticipation uh, of hope. Anticipation of hope. And there will be two main divisions in this passage that we'll look at, which will go from verse 26 down to verse 38. Uh, there are two main divisions for those of you that like to take notes. We will see, number one, an angelic or the angelic visit, and then we will see the acceptance. And really, verse uh, the angelic visit will take place from verse 26 down to verse 37, and then just verse 38, we will see uh, the second uh, main division, which is acceptance. But anticipation, anticipation is a huge part of the Christmas holiday, anticipating what's under the tree for you, anticipating what your parents have purchased for you, or maybe what grandmother, uh, grandma has, has gotten for you. I can remember growing up every year, my mom, she loved Christmas, and she would do different little things with the gifts. And one year, uh, she had wrapped all of the gifts, and she had put a number system on there. And then she had a master list, and she had a number on there, and then she had whose name that number belonged to. So um, that prevented us. I mean, we, we still shook all of the boxes, but you, you couldn't tell which ones are yours. You know, if it's got your name on it, you go, you feel it, you shake it and see what's in there. Does it break if you shake it hard enough? Or if I squeeze it, does it make any noises? But that year, uh, as we, you know, tree, the, the presents were starting to show up underneath the, the tree, we got, you know, we come to the tree as kids, and we're trying to find out which ones are ours, and it's like, 33? What is 33? You know, this was, this was 24. What is 16? We don't know what this is until we finally figured out that she had outsmarted us by putting these numbers on it so that we couldn't go around shaking all of the boxes and the packages. But the anticipation, especially for little kids, the younger that you are, the anticipation can get you in trouble, can't it? It can get you squeezing and shaking packages and trying to figure out what's in there and getting yourself in trouble by accidentally ripping one of them open or getting caught by mom or dad. And that anticipation can oftentimes, it, it, that's, what, that's, that's a, such a huge part of the holiday. And the anticipation was a huge part of the very first Christmas, and that's what we'll look at tonight, the anticipation. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, the story picks up with a young lady, a young woman, who was unmarried, who was a virgin. And it says in verse 26, now in the sixth month, what sixth month is that? Very quickly, look at verse 36. Verse 36, the angel says, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. What we do not have time to, to go back and read right now is just prior to what we're in, this passage that we're in, just prior to this, an angel, or I'm sorry, uh, an, an angel had spoken to Zechariah, and Zechariah had a wife named Elizabeth. And the angel said, listen, your wife is going to have a child. You guys are going to have a child. And that was going to be John the Baptist. Well, she was in the sixth month of her pregnancy. When this angel pays a visit to Mary. And so it says in verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. 
to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Some of the uh, um, uh, the, the ancient manuscripts don't have that little, that last phrase in there, blessed are you among women. Uh, however, the, the idea is there, rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Verse 29, but when she saw him, you can imagine, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And then finally, in verse 38, then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now I've said it a million times. I've, I've been here for about three and a half years now. And those of you that have been with us all that time, during that time, You've heard this, Jordan's heard this probably for the, you know, certainly for the last three and a half years, and he'll continue to hear it, that Christmas is my favorite holiday. I, I think that when you're a Christian, Easter is supposed to be your favorite holiday, I think. That's kind of the vibe I get. But in, but in my mind and in my heart, you cannot have the cross without first having the cradle. You cannot have Jesus dying for our sins without first being born. And the idea of this brand new baby being born and Christmas and, and all that goes along with it certainly is very, very exciting to me. Every year there are, uh, there's a competition in my house. Really, it only takes place in my mind, but I win every year. In fact, today was the beginning of that competition. We've got a tree in our house but it's not been decorated yet. We got us, you know, we, we, we've got a busy life and a uh, busy lifestyle and all of us are all over the place. And so we got as far as getting the tree in, it's there, but there's no lights, there's no ornaments, nothing's on it. It's just there. It's got some water in it. But today, this morning, I wrapped my first gift and I've stuck that under the tree, took a picture and sent it to my family and said, first, first place. It's not a competition, but I am winning, Okay. I get excited about Christmas, the anticipation of it all. Christmas Eve and, uh, I mean, all that goes along with it, going to, to my cousin's house that evening, you know, attending church, Christmas Eve service, and uh, going to my cousin's house and, you know, eating tamales and, you know, uh, uh, hugging family members and hanging out and talking and catching up. I love all of that, the anticipation of it all. Well, at the time of the birth of Jesus, there was a great anticipation for the Messiah. You and I must understand, if we can, uh, within our mind, we must travel back to that time and understand that they were under, the Jews were under Roman, Roman rule at the time. You remember uh, later on in the Christmas story when the wise men come and they deal with Herod. Do you remember what it was that Herod did to all the baby boys who were two years old and under? It was Herod, the ruler in that area, who killed all of the baby boys. And it, it was his attempt to try and find this so-called Messiah, this baby boy, and to kill him. I mean, we complain about our political leaders today, don't we? But we're not under Herod's rule. And with one command, he sends out this decree and says, you know, we're to, we're to kill all of the, the, the baby boys two years old and under, snatching them from their mother's hands. That was the type of environment that they were living in. That was the kind of rule and the oppression that they were living under. And so the anticipation of this Messiah, and they were familiar with the idea of the Messiah. They were familiar with the prophecies. 
They had heard it. They had been, it had been passed down from, from generation to generation. The fact that the, the, the Messiah, that God was going to send a Messiah to come and, and rule and reign, and they pictured that Messiah coming as a conquering Messiah and overthrowing the Romans at just the right time and ruling over the Jews, and no end to his kingdom. And we'll look at a few of those prophecies tonight. But the anticipation was high. So that at this time, in verse 26, where we get this angelic visit, this angelic visit, it's happening in the sixth month that this angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, one of the things that I like about teaching on Christmas every year is all of the details that we get. Because, because right now, the entire world, generally speaking, the entire world is celebrating Christmas. But you don't always get the details. One of my favorites, and I won't even actually, I'm jumping the gun here because I'm getting so excited, but never mind, I won't even mention it. But, but all of the details, sometimes those details get lost. And I love to pour back over the Christmas story and see all of these details. Now, when an angel came to speak to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, who would give birth to John the Baptist, we're told that it was an angel. Now we're told in verse 26, it's very specific, that the angel Gabriel was sent by God. So this is God-ordained, God-orchestrated. It is God's idea to send Gabriel to speak to this person, Mary. And he sends this angel to the city of, to a city of Galilee that was named Nazareth. And, the, and Gabriel goes there and finds in verse 27, a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. We find lots of details here about this encounter. We know that it was God who chose Gabriel to go and speak to Mary. But what about Mary? Verse 27 tells us that she was a virgin. I think we all know that. That she had not had any kind of sexual relationship with anyone up to that point. We find out also in verse 27 that she was engaged. That's that fancy word betrothed there. It means that she was engaged. And she was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. And we know from uh, the rest of the accounts of Joseph that he was a carpenter. And so he's got this, this uh, uh, almost wife named Mary that he's going to, to marry. We find out about Joseph that he is of the house of David. Now, there are a couple of different genealogies in Luke. One is in Luke chapter 1, one is in Luke chapter 3. And the one in Luke chapter 3 is believed to be the genealogy of Mary's family. And what you find there is that both Joseph and Mary were both from the line of David. That they had both descended from the line of David. And so either way, whether it's from Mary or whether it's from Joseph and Mary taking the name of Joseph, this baby is going to be born in the line of David. And all of the Jews knew from the prophecies that the Messiah was to be a son of David, someone that would be born from the family line of Jesus. They all knew that. But you can imagine that you would never, you young ladies in here, would never imagine that you would be the one to give birth to the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And certainly Mary, as we find here, was surprised by it all. We find out in verse 27 that her name is Mary. And what we have here in verse 28 is her, uh, the angel's address to Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So the first thing that we find out about Mary there is that she is highly favored. Now, this has nothing to do with the amount of followers that she had on Instagram. It had everything to do with her standing with God. We're told there, rejoice highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Uh, in, in a little bit, we'll, we'll find out that she was, that it, she, uh, uh, the angel is telling her, hey, you know, calm down. The Lord, you know, the Lord's on your side. We'll see that in just a moment. But she was highly favored of God. I think it's interesting that the angel appears to her. 
she seems to understand whether the angel showed up and he's glowing and he's bright and he's hovering over her bed or, you know, he's, you know, whatever, she's in the bathroom and he shows, I don't know. She seems to be surprised by this. And she seems to understand that there's something, there's something extraordinary going on here. Whether the angel showed up in angelic form or whether he showed up in the form of a man and appeared to Mary, we're not sure. But either way, even if he appeared like a man, like we would see sometimes see uh, in the Old Testament, you know, when the angels came to visit um, uh, Abraham, you know, they appeared as guys out there walking around. Either way, she realized, I do not know this person. And then he begins by saying this, rejoice or celebrate. Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. And then in verse 29, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. For some of us, it doesn't take much to be startled, does it? very easily done. You might be easily scared in your own home with your own family in the, in the home. And it might just be that you are in the kitchen or whatever and you turn around and mom or dad or one of your siblings is, is standing there and you're startled by that. Some people are easily startled. Well, you can imagine being this young lady and she is, uh, we, we're not sure if she's, uh, 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 where, where exactly she's at, but this angel shows up and appears to her, and she's startled by this. She's taken back by this, to say the least. It says in verse 29 that she was troubled. That means that she was fearful at his saying. Now again, what was it that he said to her? Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. That doesn't seem like anything to be troubled about but she does not know who this man is or who this angel is. She's frightened by this. And so we find there that she's troubled at his saying. And it says in verse 29 that she considered what manner of greeting this was. Her mind, the gears immediately begin to turn. What is this? What's going on? What's happening? Who is this? What did he just say? What did he call me? Verse 30, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. I always think it's funny in the scriptures when the angels say to someone, don't be afraid. Too late. I'm already afraid. You're an angel and I'm a person and I'm, I'm afraid I might die. And the angel will, will say, do not be afraid. But he gives her a reason here in verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And you see, there is no better reason to not fear than the fact that you have found favor with God. Sometimes people trying to be helpful will, will try to pump us up and encourage us and tell us, hey, come on, don't be afraid. And you might be thinking, okay, but why? They don't have a reason. It's just toughen up, man. Come on, you can do it. Si se puede. You know, come on. All right, here we go. Don't be afraid. All right, but why? I might die. But he gives her a reason why. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. You found favor with God. And I'll tell you, there's no better remedy for fear than knowing that God is on your side. Knowing that God is for you and not against you. Knowing and believing the words that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you're facing some hardship or some scary situation, some uncertain times to know that God is for you. There's nothing more settling than that. The peace that passes all understanding comes flooding in at that moment, knowing that, you know what, I, I know that this, this situation is so uncertain, but I know that God's in it. And people will look at you in awe, and they're going, "Hey, what do you, you know? How can you how can you uh, uh, be this way? You know, you're facing such a such a, 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 a stressful situation, and it's so uncertain, and it's so scary. How do you do it?" And you go, "Man, I really don't know. I I, I really am just trusting God, and I, I don't I don't know where this peace is coming from. I mean, it's coming from God, I guess, but you know, it, it's not me." And he gives her a reason not to fear. He finds out, she finds out in this address that she is highly favored. You might even say that she is in good standing 
with God. The next thing that he does in verse 31 down to verse 37 is he gives an announcement. And what she finds here in this announcement is that she has a high calling. First, she found out in his address that she was highly favored. Now she will find out in this announcement that he has, that she has this high calling. She first found out that she was in good standing with God. Now she will find out that she will give birth to the Son of God. Verse 31 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Can't be any more accurate than that. Pinpoint it. God gave those directions. Verse 32 he will be great. Now, what we find here in the next couple of verses is a description of the baby that she will have. You see, this is prophetic at this point. She's not had this baby yet. She's going to have this baby. And so this angel in this announcement is prophesying to her, here's what God is going to do. Verse 32, he will be great. I mean, that's not hard for a mom to understand, right? Some of you have those moms, probably all of you. And your mom just always thinks you're great no matter what you do. My mom was that way. I could have gone to prison and she would have thought I was a great prisoner. She was just that way. No matter what I did, you know, it was always, oh, you know, my baby boy. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm so proud of you. And, oh, you did such a great job. And, you know, that type of, and, and many of you probably have that kind of mom. Well, this angel announces that, hey, you're going to have this son. You're going to name him Jesus. And in verse 32, he will be great. And he will be called the son of the highest. So she would immediately begin to realize this is not going to be Joseph's son. (laughs) Because Joseph certainly is not the highest. (laughs) But this is, he's going to be called son of the highest. Notice these titles. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He's going to inherit that throne. He's going to get that throne from the Lord God. Can you imagine the weight of all of that falling on her heart? In verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, these are the words that the Jews had longed to hear for ages. But especially at this time, as the Romans were ruling over them, oftentimes with a heavy hand, to hear that the Messiah, the Son of God, is finally coming into existence, going to be born, and to hear that he is going to rule, and in verse 33, that his kingdom will never end. I mean, I want you to think about the time and the day and the place that you and I are living in. We are seeing things changing politically daily. Some of us are hearing about it on social media. Some of us are hearing about it at home. Some of us are hearing about it in the classroom. And there are some reasons to be fearful and you're looking at things stirring and what's going on and what's he doing and what's she doing and how are they voting and what kind of laws and you're hearing all of this. I mean, imagine even for you and I right now to hear that, oh, Yes, things are so topsy-turvy and things are so uncertain, but Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming tomorrow. Imagine hearing that news, how your heart would anticipate and rejoice, the excitement that would stir in your heart. And so it was for them. His kingdom, there will be no end. And then in verse 34, Mary, I like her. She seems to me, I imagine Mary to be very practical. I am a very practical person. It drives people crazy. Sometimes I'm like Spock. Any Trekkies in here? No Trekkies? Yes? Okay. Unfortunately, my mother's one. Unfortunately, your mother's one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to watch uh, uh, Star Trek uh, when, I was, when I was little, way back in the 1900s. 
And, uh, you know, Dr. Spock was on there and he was just always emotionless, you know, just no feeling. And sometimes I drive people crazy that way because it's like, you know, right now, right now we've got a puppy at our home. It's cute. It's cute. My daughter, my youngest daughter has been fostering it. Fostering it. It's time for the puppy to go. Oh, but look, this is too cute. Mm -hmm, it's cute. It's time for the puppy to go. But, you know, the baby was there, like, you know, and it was all this and that. And it was malnutrition, you know, and this is, uh-huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, that's, that's good. Okay, it's time for the, the puppy to go. I can be that way oftentimes, and it comes across as just heartless or emotionless or, you know, what are you, Dr. Spock, what's wrong with you? I like that Mary, she appears to me to be a practical woman. Oftentimes, the ladies, I think that many of you ladies in here would admit to this, that sometimes you struggle with your emotions. Some of you are like, sometimes, like, I struggle with my emotion. You, you can be very, very emotional, and sometimes the guys can be too, okay? Not me, I'm manly, okay? But Mary, Mary does not seem to be so emotional. In fact, in verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man, I'm not married, I've not been with a man sexually, how could I possibly be pregnant? She's practical. She's like, okay, um, so, okay, I'm going to give, okay, I'm going to have a baby, I'm going to give birth to Messiah, son of the highest, okay, that's great. But how's this supposed to happen? You know, she, she, she almost, almost, almost is to the point of ignoring what she's been told about the son that she's going to have. And she's still focused on, wait, I'm going to have a son, but I'm, I'm not even married. What are you talking about? I've not even been with a man. So she's thinking practically. Well, the angel answers her in verse 35. I, I think about, you know, just in my strange mind, I think about this scene, the scenario. It might, I mean, it doesn't seem to have lasted very long. But I imagine that the angel Gabriel would show up just so excited. God, it's time. God's going to send his son into the world. This is it. You know, the countdown. And here it is. It's time. And he comes to me. You want me to? You, like Gabriel, like Gabriel's thinking, I get, I get to go preach to Mary. Oh, this is wonderful. And he comes down. And he tells Mary, this is incredible. You know, rejoice. Highly favored one. You're going to have, you know, you're going to give birth to a son. It's going to be Jesus. He's the Messiah. You're highly favored. He's going to be the son of the highest. And Mary's like, oh, oh, but how's that supposed to happen? She doesn't seem to be moved by, by what the baby was going to be or who the baby was going to be, at least in this moment. How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest, that's God, will overshadow you. In fact, Mary... This will be all of God. Yes, your body will be utilized. You are going to be a vessel. But Mary, you must understand that this is going to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, of God's Spirit. This is not you, Mary, making this happen, orchestrating this thing. We need no more uh, you know, stories of, uh, 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 you know, any more Jacob stories, you know. We don't, we don't need you to, to do it yourself or, or, or Abraham. Uh, uh, we don't need you to do it yourself. God is going to do it. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One, here it is, verse 35. He hits her with this. That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. She was called barren. But she will give birth to a wild, outdoorsy man who would wear camel hair and eat locusts and wild honey. She was called barren. But in verse 37, this is one that all of us can memorize. It's short enough. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. At just the right time. 
I mean, we do not even have time to go into the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth and her barrenness and their inability to have a baby for so many years because God was waiting for just the right time. Okay, now, now's the time. And we got six months, and then we're going to announce to Mary what's going on. What an incredible story. You know that this was not the first time, this prophecy here, this anticipation, was not the first time that uh, any Jew had, had heard they had been hearing for years. In fact, did you, uh, did you know this, that in Genesis chapter 3, the very first prophecy... And the very first prophecy concerning the Messiah was actually not given to anyone, to any person. It was given to Satan first. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fell into sin. And the serpent had deceived them. And as God is dealing with the situation, he says to Satan, we're told there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And then he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, speaking of Jesus, shall bruise your head or crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The very first prophecy concerning the Messiah was actually spoken to Satan. And no doubt, I mean, Adam and Eve must have, you know, been there in the vicinity at least or been around and heard that, but he was directing that towards Satan and promising. It wasn't just a threat, but a promise. Because of what you have done, Messiah, I will send a Savior Pay for the sin to crush your head, Satan. There are many others, but a few of our favorites probably. In Isaiah chapter 7, through Ahaz, God said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He spoke again in Isaiah chapter 9. I love this one. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle, uh, uh, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle, and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. You see, at that time of hardship, the prophecy comes again. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment, judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. He said again in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. The anticipation of it all. As God throughout the ages prophesied of a coming Messiah, and finally, finally the time has come, but not to be born in a palace, but in a manger not to simply appear supernaturally in the sky, but to come through the body of a young lady, a peasant. What an incredible, incredible way to introduce the Savior of the world. Not high and lofty so that we cannot reach him, but low and humble born in a stable in a manger where anyone 
from any social standing can reach him. That's what we're celebrating. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. Finally, in verse 38, we see the acceptance. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What do we see there? Lastly, we see her acceptance characterized in full submission. Did you hear what she said to the angel? She said, Behold. That means, that means this. It means, look. Look at your maidservant or the maidservant of the Lord. She, what she says to the angel is, Gabriel, you're looking at the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Whatever God wants, I'm his woman, she said. Now, how about you and I this Christmas? Are we being careful not to get caught up in the anticipation of all of the gifts? It's hard for me. It's hard for me. But are we focused and remembering and are we wondering and are we in awe of all that God accomplished some 2,000 years ago in sending his son to be born through this young lady, to be raised by these pe peasant parents? The wonder of it all is that God did not stay in heaven and expect us to, to reach up to him in, in, in some way, but that he sent his son down into our world. Not so that we could reach out to him, but so that he could reach out to us. It was God who made the effort. It was God who was anticipating are the payment for our sin and a love relationship between him and you and between him and me. Ah, oh, the anticipation. It's exciting this season. God, help me to not get caught up, but to be like Mary, I'm yours. God, you're looking at the maid servant. You're looking at your, you're looking at your servant, God. That's who I want to be this Christmas, and I hope that's who you want to be also that as it draws closer and closer, that the things and the stuff mean less and less, and that the reason for it all means more and more. Father, thank you so much. For